because of all that wealth, there's side effects or something, you know, because maybe we, maybe I would be annoyed to have that many close relations or something. Cause I'm an American, I'm an independent, you know, right. um, but you have to take the consequences of that. Maybe, which is this, which is the isolation, you know, and uh, maybe that's what a lot of people are trying to figure out right now in America is uh, you know, how do you belong somewhere? We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the goons to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings and welcome to The Anadromist. This is Burn Power, coming to you with another in our Anadromist Dialogues from Tbilisi, Georgia. And today we have uh, Justin Wells, who has begun a documentary project about the little corner of the internet, which is uh, bracketed by... uh, Paul Vanderclay, John Verveke, Jonathan Peugeot, kind of uh, just this this area. And I'm kind of in there as well, kind of on one of the uh, edges, but nevertheless feeling uh, certainly fine to identify myself as a member of that fine zone of virtuality seeking to become physical reality. Anyway, um... We started talking, and I, like an idiot, forgot to press record. I often say in life there are, there are different sources for our problems. And one could be our desires. Another one could be the desires of other people that, you know, could be the physical reality, you know, an earthquake or something like that. And sometimes it's just stupidity. <laughs> and But there are times when stupidity kills. You know, you don't have... You've done something wrong. Uh, I have certainly... I've slipped twice off a mountain ledge in my life due to stupidity. I'm still here for some reason. Other people aren't. Well, uh, ju- so due to stupidity, uh, Justin and I talked for about, I don't know, 40 minutes, and I didn't press record. (laughs) So this conversation starts off after that. We had a very interesting conversation about uh, where we are in the film world right now. It seems like we're at one of these pivotal points between... Uh, where things have to change. And I think culturally, a lot of things are going to be changing. And Justin works in the uh, camera department. Uh, I'm not sure exactly if he's full uh, cinematographer, DP, or assistant uh, cameraman or something like that. I forgot to ask. But he does actually have an IMDB page. So you could look that up. Although it just says camera. So... That's that's vague, but but uh, he has a, a nice little resume there, and so we actually met each other for the first time last year in Landau, Germany, as part of the Bridges of Meaning conference, and that's also the first time I met Paul Vanderclay in the flesh. And evidently, I just found out they're doing another one in October, and I had a thought. Oh. Uh, uh, a person, a smart person, while there is still time to come to Georgia, I do have a few seats left at the table, would say to themselves, hey, I could go to Georgia, to Burns Gathering in Georgia, and you really should look for that. Uh, uh, go look, check out my videos on the subject. Um, I could do that and then at the end of the month go to Germany 
uh, back to Mannheim for the new uh, festival. So the uh, it's just a thought. You could do two for one with a little couple of weeks off in between uh, for vacation time. Think about that, and and if you want to come here, you are still welcome. We still have some open space. I have about four open seats. So, um, and it costs a few dollars, but hey, if you were going to go to that other one, or if you were thinking, oh, I'd like to, but just a little extra, you know. So, um, before we get going here and listen to the conversation, uh, do subscribe to the channel if you are not subscribed. Do um, share the video. This one is not kind of a rambling one, but share some videos. Uh, we do get to good conversation. And in fact, uh, because of the nature, I started off saying, well, let's not repeat what we were just trying to do. There's nothing worse than trying to repeat the conversation you just had for the camera. We'll come back to that some other time. But rather than try to repeat, we just started talking. I, I said, uh, you know, I hit record, but I was saying, I'm not even sure I'm going to use this. And then as we got going, we realized, oh, maybe we're saying something interesting here, certainly by the second half of it. We kind of rambled. We talk, he was, He's interested in what's going on here and uh, maybe how it relates to the Bridges of Meaning and uh, the estuary and all of the little corner stuff. And so we talked about Tbilisi and what makes Tbilisi interesting and why this particular period of time, Tbilisi is kind of where it's at. <laughs> I don't know how I arrived here in time, but I did. Um, and we talk about why. Then later, we talk about other things related to the film world and stuff. Like I say... The conversation rambles and rambles into some interesting stuff. If you want to just get to beyond me talking about uh, the practical side of living here, you know, start at about the half hour point. But it's a conversation. Give it a listen. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, Justin Wells, I, I got him to introduce himself again, and then we go into the, uh, the second part of our conversation, which was recorded. One more time, just explain uh, in a brief manner for my folks who you are. Okay, yeah, I'm so I'm I'm Justin Wells. I uh, I'm I'm born and raised in California. I live in LA. I'm a movie guy by trade. I'm a camera guy, camera technician, and um, uh, my so that's my paycheck and my passion is documentary. I write uh, about the history of documentary film. I teach a little bit in college um, do about documentary and um, making a documentary about this little corner of the internet uh, right now. And um, and that's me. And and I'm I'm interested in in uh, everything. That's why I like documentary. <laughs> and if you want to uh, see uh, Justin talking more about these things, check out Grim Grizz's channel and Paul Vanderclay's channel. I'll put the links down below for those. And my my channel, I, I have a, a lecture series on documentary. On uh, it's just called Justin's Morning Coffee, and I, I there's a a playlist there which is my lectures that I teach about documentary history, and then there's one on the seven basic plots. Great. Okay, so I will uh, link all those below. We're gonna scrub that conversation because yeah. I don't want to try to recreate it at all, and we'll yeah. maybe we'll talk yeah. together in about a week or so. And uh, yeah. and just start anew, and we can cover some of the same stuff. But right now, it's just too like, oh, we said all that stuff. A lot, some of that was interesting. Uh, and I don't <laughs> want to try to go back. So such is that's life. fine as well. <laughs> such is life. <laughs> I need to switch to my new webcam. Where are you? Oh uh, no. Okay, choose this guy. And ta da! Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's getting so the thing I can't figure out about this thing is it just won't uh, adjust for light very well. And uh, mm. it's, oh, it's it's good. It, you see, I use a Sony, and right. and um, so if if the light changes, I have to manually adjust it. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what I'm but what I have I'm a pretty thing on this is it doesn't have a manual adjustment thing, and that's otherwise. I oh, I see. Yeah. 
Uh, right now, I've got curtains up. I mean, if I show you this, hold on a minute. That's a big mm -hmm. curtain on my window. And there's another curtain over there. And they're yeah. there so that I don't. Uh... Yeah, it's a nice diffusion. It's like a yeah. front front uh, diffusion light. Yeah. Well, I'm doing it. Um, oh, I know what I'm doing. I don't like the fact I'm looking at a green uh, little light either. I may put a little bit of tape over it just so I don't have to stare at it. Are you are you looking at the image of me, or do you look right at the camera? I have to look at you. No, I'm look. I, I if I look at the light, I've tried to get them as close as possible. So yeah. that's why See, I'm, I'm sitting. I went. This, this <laughs> I went completely overboard. I have this is a teleprompter half right. glass right here, and then I have um, my little monitor reflecting, and flipped it. Here, which is my second computer monitor, is right below, so right. it reflects, and then and then right the lens is right there. Right. So and that's right where your image is. So, um, but I I went way overboard. <laughs> well, then again, you know more about the technical stuff than I do for sure. So, um, yeah, I, a little bit, but just enough yeah. to make videos. More than Paul, though. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's, you know, off and on and a few technical settings, and then he's done. And uh, yeah. he, he makes so many videos because he just turns it on, records it, never edits anything, and then puts it out yeah. there. I, Whereas I am, I know. I am uh, congenitally, uh, uh, I have to edit. You know, it's just, and mm -hmm. so I create all these videos that are chopped up and all this stuff happening, and it's just my Do you story. use Premiere? For editing? No, I use Final Cut Pro. I'm, I'm oh, you use Final Cut Pro? Mac. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I use Premiere, and yeah, it takes a long time for me. Those those seven basic plots videos I was doing with all of those movie clips and everything, it would oh, yeah, take yeah. about a to make one of those. You know, it's just, it's a lot, you know. Yeah. Well, um, well it seems uh, like but, we're doing better. I haven't, I, I think it's just that computer. There's some weird permission or something. Hmm slip the and i have to i have to isolate it but then again that is my backup computer so what i need to do is get all the work that i'm doing on that one off and then mm -hmm. shut it down and put this one on it again that is to say mm -hmm. they're both the same and i do that so that i can back this one up and put it on there mm -hmm. and if worse comes to worse and i have a uh this one goes down i have that one that's ready yeah. to go again. So I, I keep going back and forth. I used to have three, but I've can cannibalized uh, the parts on the third one. And I have a fourth one back in Alaska. I'm trying to bring my my library of stuff here. And it's a big library. I really do. Mm -hmm. So uh, it will fit up, fill up the rest of this room and a room just the same size on the other side from this, plus a hallway in between. And uh, Wow. Is it hard to ship things from Alaska all the way to Georgia? Uh, Is it like it's, customs? It's, it's possible. I'm, uh, well, that's the thing I have to deal with. Uh, next week, I think on Monday, I'll go out there to the customs office. I've One thing I found out is they want a list of everything, mm -hmm. which yep. is a nightmare because I have over 10,000 LPs and CDs. I have... Yeah probably several thousand movies. I have all these books. Fortunately, the books, they don't tax. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise I'd be ruined. <laughs> but the way it is, is I have to declare, I think each record is a dollar each or something like that. I just want yeah. to I just call the whole library a dollar because mm -hmm. when I bring it here, not only are there no, no record stores, you can't even buy a Blu-ray player in the, uh, I mean, the, no one uses physical media here. Yeah. And they, yeah. because they arrived on the scene, they came out of communism, then went through 10 years or more of poverty and warfare in the 90s. And then uh, their, uh, so their whole, uh, what, what is it? Their whole uh, infrastructure was ruined. And when they kind of came back online, well, it was the online world. And so they just started downloading music, downloading videos. When I first got here, there was a system that they had that um, 
was you could literally get everything for free and just download it and watch it. And I did that with a lot of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You get everything off HBO, everything off Showtime, everything off Amazon, everything off uh, Disney, everything off, uh, you know, uh, Hulu, everything off, you, you know, all everything. And then mm -hmm. what happened was when the uh, Ukrainian war started, then then the uh, the Georgia said, we want to join the U European Union because technically we are in Europe, uh, at least part of the country is. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the EU said, well, here's what you're going to have to start doing. And so they, they said, uh oh, we've got all this stuff going on with IP rights. And so they uh, they had to cancel. They 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 canceled that whole system. And mm -hmm. uh, then I was thrown back on that. Really, do I want to buy? You know, do, do I want to subscribe to Netflix? And, and Netflix was the other big one. Do I want to subscribe to Netflix? Do I want Amazon? Do I? No, I don't. I don't want to buy all these. So uh, I've been relying more on watching uh, YouTubers talking about stuff and saying, oh, that, you know, what they're talking about or showing clips from that sounds good, you know, from the mm -hmm. ones I trust. Um, yeah. And then what I'll do if I really want to see it is I'll order a digit uh, a DVD, and in some cases I will. Uh, like last October, I re-upped on Netflix for a month, and mm -hmm. um, and then watched all the stuff I wanted to watch, and then jumped off again because I I, yeah. I really didn't want to get totally addicted to the system, so. Well, I I know about shipping. You know, I had to we have to carnet everything, you know, cause they want to make sure that you don't sell it, you know? And so to go to Greece, mm -hmm. you know, every single, every single piece of my equipment, I had to ser the serial number, the part, you know, mm -hmm. everything, this huge list. And then it gets through in, in a couple weeks, you know, but anything that I forgot that I said, Oh shoot, you know, and I, I'd call back here to LA and say, hey, ship this or ship that. If I didn't do a separate carnet for it, mm -hmm just had to go through customs it never arrived you know because mm -hmm. it was just like once it's once it's going through that custom system where it's a a piece of, in my case you know a little piece of equipment that costs a hundred dollars or something you right. know it's like okay forget it you're never and so the the greek guys you know the, in the greek production office they said honestly you can't get anything from the uk you can't get anything from the states once you're here you have to source it somewhere within europe you know so i was using the italy amazon right. And I was using the German Amazon to find right, little right. pieces, parts, you know, and well, and I thought, wow, yeah, we've got a nice system here. It's called USA to Georgia. So what they've done is created a fake address for me in Delaware, and there's a warehouse there that is me, <laughs> and so I can get anything in America sent there, and then they'll ship it here, oh, okay. and uh, see. that that works out well. Uh, that's how I keep getting books and blu-rays and whatever i need um and and uh parts and you know webcams mm -hmm. and stuff like that is it is it part so it is part of the eu now so you could you no, could also order from like they were you know. just starting to say but they don't realize what they're going to have to do to be part of the eu mm -hmm. they're a little naive about all that so uh um, right right but i uh but no i have to send an entire container of stuff here Mm -hmm. and so right. it'll have to all be locked up and then uh uh i'll deal with it somehow but that's where the the tough part comes because and 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 it's going to be one thing to uh have um it's going to be one thing to have a uh what is it um, to get, I, I have one thing I have to find out is whether everything needs to be on a pallet and wrapped up in plastic or not, or if I can just layer it in the container. Cause it, I, fortunately in Alaska, I'm right on, uh, the shipping lanes. I'm up a fjord and, and there's a dock and the barge comes there and it ships things a thousand miles to Seattle. And, hmm. uh, so I can do that. And and you know I'll, I I can get uh, the container and everything there. There's a shipping company, everything like that works. Yeah. 
So, and that will go all the way here to Poti, and hopefully they can put it on a train and bring it here to the customs office in Tbilisi. That's what I have to still find out. If not, yeah. then it's a t totally different situation. But, uh, oh, man. and then I'm hoping I don't have to pay much. What I'm trying to do is to, you know, I'm getting older. I'll be 68 this year. And um, so I'm not going to live forever. And uh, once I get the stuff here, it may be really nice, but eventually I'm going to die. So what happens to my stuff? So I'm thinking of, I've been talking to people about uh, turning my stuff, since it's such a large library, into some sort of study center. And mm -hmm. then going from there with... Uh, uh, you know, if I get some sort of backing here, then I can avoid the taxes. Mm -hmm. so we'll see. Uh, but yeah. first I have to go take, so I have these, I, I did get one good thing out of AI. I realized I had to make a list of every record. Well, I'm also sitting there saying, nobody is going to go through my entire collection with a list of mm -hmm. names for everything. Yeah. They're not, yeah. they don't care that on that kind of detail. Nobody does. So what yeah. I'm going to do or I've already done is I've made a list of over 10,000 albums mm -hmm. and it's uh, and the, the way I did it is rather than I, I had to do it by hand at a certain point, but I made a list of, I, I would tell the AI, give me a list of 200 albums, country and Western albums between 1960 and 1980. And then it would mm -hmm. spit out this list. And I would look at it and go, mm -hmm. that doesn't sit there. And that's a duplicate. And, but it doesn't matter. Because yeah. yeah. all I need is I just need a list. So, you know, yeah. and I go through all these genres in my mind. You know, give me all the Brazilian records. Give me a list of 50 Brazilian records. Give me a list of reggae, 200 reggae records. Give me a list of, you know, 100 yeah. uh, San Francisco rock psychedelic records or whatever. And just, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I... I and so I ended up with a big list of that. Another one for movies, I would just go, you know, give me a list of uh, 200 horror films. Give me a list of of uh, all the films by X, you know, all the Hitchcock films or something like that. And so it spit out all these lists. And uh, so now it looks like I've done my uh, diligence yeah. on it. But. Right. Boy, yeah, living as an expat, I can't imagine. I mean, it, 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 uh, I, there's probably so many little complicated things that you have to that we would that I would never think about, okay. you know. Yeah. And, and well, that's only, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to before. Unfortunately, I don't have a printer here, which is probably fine in this case. Is I have to go over to uh, there are all these little cop copy shops around here because nobody has a printer. And again, they hit this weird time where, you know, so much happens now just online. But nevertheless, now and then you need paper. And uh, yeah. so you go to the copy shop, especially to make official pieces of of uh, contracts and things like that. But also things that the government is always asking you for little things when you go to do something. And so yeah. I'm going to take my list and I have about, I don't know, 10 pages of of record lists and another four pages of uh movie lists and such and make you know have those all printed up then take them with mm -hmm. me and as and so i can just hold it up and say something like this and they can mm -hmm. say, uh yes but we need all the prices next to it i says a dollar a piece <laughs> you know because they're, if they're yeah. personal if they were to and and if anybody wants to say yes but they're worth more than that i said they're worth more than that if i'm in france yeah, where people actually <laughs> buy and sell records. They're worth more than that if I'm in Amsterdam, you know, where people yeah. actually buy and sell records. Mm -hmm. They're not worth anything here because nobody mm -hmm. buys and sells this stuff here. There are not stores. There, are, people don't want vinyl LPs that I have made mm -hmm. it worthless because huh. I want these here with me. I'm. They're not here. They're not. They're not commercial property anymore. They are just. Mm -hmm. so, so, and do you have the sophistication of the language to be able to have the, that kind of a conversation with the, with the officials, or do you have to get help from some like um, a translator? That's that's an interesting question. I think at the customs office, 
And usually, like, I had to go to the tax office first. And then they said, now you have to go to the customs office. Then you have to go to the official government office. And then you come back to the tax office to make your payment. Mm -hmm. So, but I have to declare everything. And I have to, um, I don't have a lot of technical stuff. But I am, I, I realize I, I bought a TV uh, since I've been here. And um, so I don't need my TV again, uh, you know, so mm -hmm. I'll have a garage sale or something in Alaska and people. Are you going to have to go to Alaska? Huh? You're going to have to go there? And, yeah. You're going to have to fly to Alaska? There. It's not in a oh. container yet. So oh. I have to go there and I have to pick through my stuff and go, I, no, I don't need the bed. No, I don't need this. I've got three nice pieces of furniture, but I'm afraid to bring I don't have room for all three, quite frankly. So yeah. I'm just going to bring two. So I'll sell that. And some, uh, you know, basically, once I get to Alaska, I'll be selling off as much as possible. But only mm -hmm. of practical things, not of the actual media, you know. So yeah. uh, because that's what I want, you know. But I don't want, uh, I have three really nice old, like 100-year-old uh, chest of drawers. So I'll, I'll take mm -hmm. the two I like the best. There's one I really want, and it's got a mirror on it, but it's too big, and it's got a mirror on it, and I don't want to travel around the world with a mirror. So yeah, that I should be able to get a couple hundred dollars for at least in Alaska. Because yeah. in Alaska, if you put furniture and tools, the vultures start swarming. If you mm -hmm. say uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, they're there at 8 going like, right, can we come in yet? <laughs> like, like Nine o'clock. <laughs> Nine o'clock. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. I, my mother passed away about uh, 2015. And I had to clear out her, uh, her, all her stuff from her room. Literally everything sold except for just a handful of stuff. So all her furniture, all, I mean, it's amazing how much stuff sold. So I'm not in mm -hmm. that position i already went through this nightmare of cleaning up my house and then they raised the place i was in which is part of the reason i ended up moving but mm. um but but still i have a lot of uh stuff to that i you know as i've thought about it, i said oh no i don't need that now and you know let me go through uh and find this and that but especially if i have any tools left let me get rid of those if i have any uh uh you know, and especially any electric tools. I can't use those here. Yeah. I may have gotten rid of those. I had a garage sale before, but now I've rethought everything. Mm. So the I point is to bring as little excess as possible because I'm in this three room yeah. flat here, but it's, uh, and it's pretty good size, but it's, mm -hmm. but it's still, you know, most of it's going to be taken up by library. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, as you know, I, I have a, a secret dream of moving to Europe someday, you know, so I, I, I pay attention to uh, to how people how people manage well, living. As this an is a great place yeah. for several reasons. Let me let me sell you on Georgia. For one thing, even if you don't um, get a uh, residence permit here, which I did because I was doing work for people. Uh, you can stay here for 365 days a year. You have to step outside of the country, play tag with Armenia or something, step back in, and you're good for the next 365 days. Mm -hmm. So that's one good thing. Secondly, yeah, um, we did experience a spike in prices as a result of both the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war and we received over 100,000 Russians new into the country uh, as a result of people fleeing Putin's Russia and the mobilization. It can't happen anymore. But that did create a, those things created a spike in prices. But having said that, it's still a pretty cheap place to live. And so, uh, and especially coming from California, you look at the the, the prices on things like, <laughs> you know, it's just like they're giving yeah. the land away. You know, they're giving things yeah. away compared to California prices, you know, when yeah. it comes to property and stuff, stuff like that. Um, the next thing is 
because of, but not, well, it was really interesting before the Russians came, but because the Russians were coming, I, I look at it as we're kind of like in Casablanca, where you have this really weird mix of people all together. It's like Berlin in the 80s or something. It's this really interesting mix of people. And the Russians yeah. who fled were not the, you know, Putinistas. They were not the poor, uh, ignorant Russians. They were all the people who were entre entrepreneurs. I mean, Russia probably lost all of its entrepreneurs the, during mm. the, uh, the beginning of the war. Uh, but they also lost, I, I mean, I'm dealing with their puppet people, but all their creative, a lot of their creative people left. You know, mm. uh, it seems like uh, a majority of the YouTubers ended up here. You know, it's, it's, um, so you've got, you've got, uh, culturally, it's, it's, it's a very interesting place. Right now, I would say, what would be a more interesting city to live in? And quite frankly, I can't think of it for cultural stuff. Because it's hmm. what it is is it's it's they're still working they're still trying to figure out where they're going, and so hmm. um, it was it had a delayed effect from uh, the the Soviet Union you know because of this war period and poverty period they entered it wasn't until about two thousand five that they even could be say you could say that they even uh, recovered or began to recover. I mean, 2005 here was about 1990 in Prague, in the Czech Republic. Mm. So right. they're wow. still like feeling, what can we do? You know, and there's a lot of stuff. It's a very interesting expat scene here. And uh, people from different countries, as not just the Russians. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just a fascinating place. And, uh, and so, so what's your your daily routine like you know like what's what like t this is a saturday for you like what 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 do you do you, do you go down to the cafe or is it like there's plenty of nice cafes. yeah no, I, I, like last night i hung out with a russian friend at a cafe across the street i'm living in a particularly nice area and i've kind of moved up into there but that's the nice thing of coming from america even though i'm just basically living on uh retirement plus some extras but for me it goes a long way and uh so i'm living in one of the better parts of town and uh it's it's quite nice so yeah you can go to cafes uh there's there's the movie theaters uh i mean i've been watching most of the uh the obvious movies come here and the great thing is often you're going to see you know the, what was it the recent movie by uh Ari Aster, uh, Bo is Afraid. I just went and saw it. A lot of people who speak English were there. No subtitles even. <laughs> no subtitles? <laughs> no subtitles. On it. Yeah. 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 Every now and then that happens where the movie just comes and they just figure like, ah, who's going to want to see this in Georgian? But yeah, want to see it in English. So uh, we, we saw Top Gun Maverick in Athens uh -huh. over the summer with greek subtitles you know yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was but in budapest we had a lot of trouble finding because they for some reason they like to dub right in budapest right. Yeah. you know well and so then it's like you can't even watch it in english there are georgian movies here that are dubbed but i never go mm -hmm. to them, you know but there right. is an interesting movie scene here hmm. and uh, georgia actually has a fascinating history of film and uh, they they made some of the best uh, Soviet era films, mm -hmm. and uh, there's there's been filmmaking going on. the The main problem is distribution for their films, and yeah. they, they, there needs. I have a friend who's working to try to get a a theater that just shows Georgian films, you know, so mm -hmm. that they you know the, just to help because unfortunately you have the the big American films, so you don't have that many. Georgian films here. And another problem is if there's a foreign language film that's good, like Parasite or some French film or something, they're going to show it with Georgian subtitles in the original language, which of course is good. right. So, yeah, but uh, yeah. no, I, uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, a fascinating cultural scene with a lot of different people here involved in the arts. And the interesting thing is Tbilisi has about maybe 12, 1300, well, no, 
uh, one million, about three hundred thousand people now. I'd say with the Russians here, mm-hmm. and uh, but among the creative folks, it's like everybody knows everybody. So mm-hmm. everyone knows who the artist, you know, the artists all know the artists, but they also know them, the filmmakers and they know the ballet dancers. And, you know, it's just, it's a very interesting scene, very fascinating. Um, and there's a lot of cultural things here that are very inspiring because no one's ever seen them. Like uh, one of the things I've noticed is that Georgian art, uh, all the way up through the uh, postmodern period, and the, no, the postmodern period is where they start to have a problem because it starts to look like postmodern work everywhere, which is to say, mm-hmm. okay, it's a concept. But before that, even up through the Soviet period, it's very distinctive. So there's all this art here that no one's ever seen anywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's right. just, it's, uh, right. but they just keep making their own art and they make their own uh, music. Uh, the traditional music here is fantastic. And, mm-hmm. uh, and theater, they have their own style. I mean, one of the reasons I'm here is because there are five puppet theaters in town in the city, hmm. which is more than London and more than Paris. You know, it's I, I consider this a and great puppet town. Are you involved? Like, are you actually involved in putting on any puppet shows or, uh, um, or, or not yet? Though I've been told by a friend of mine that I can use his theater space anytime. Mm-hmm. My problem is I need to get my stuff here. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, my brain will open up after that mm-hmm. so, but i've gotten to know all sorts of people here so it's it's quite nice and get invited yeah um, right i mean of course i'm working on my videos but uh what's nice about where i live is that there are a lot of really nice stores in the area too a lot of uh you know so i can go to either a Georgian fruit stand, or there are two uh, supermarkets across the main uh, boulevard for me. Uh, mm-hmm. There is one place up here called uh, Gastronomy, which has four different stores in town. And they get cheeses from France and Switzerland and Spain. And, and so th- they're a really great place for, you know, all sorts of imported stuff. But yeah. it's improved a lot as far as uh, food distribution here over the years. I've been here four years now. And I also remember it. Well, the first time I came here was uh, 2016. And at that time, it was a lot more primitive, just the distribution system. And they've improved quite a bit. So, yeah, I would say, um, yeah, it's, it's, well, so many things have improved. And they have quite a bit of, of, uh, there are studios here and film equipment and all that as well. Mm-hmm. So I've actually yeah. got this great idea for a film that I want to do. And I've okay. got, I've got my people for it. I don't have a, a cinematographer yet, but I've got, uh, uh, it's just a, a short, I want to make something that's like a horror film, but Georgians don't do horror films. They don't tell horror stories. They don't, uh, mm-hmm. they don't have horror literature or anything like that. So in order to get my idea, I went through these books of folklore and then came up with this uh, this uh, goddess demon who lives up in the mountains. And mm-hmm. her name is Dali, like Salvador Dali. And uh, and if she if you come across her, she's very seductive, and she gives you, uh, in a sense, your heart's desire. But there's a big catch to it, and the catch is where the horror comes in. The catch okay. is. Uh, you can't tell anybody. Mm. And if you tell anybody, then she Uh comes back for you. So I've got a friend of mine who runs a puppet theater here. I want him to be the main actor set in the the COVID period where uh, he had just opened up his, uh, his, he had just bought this this small theatrical space, opened it up, and then COVID came. And so I want to do him just naturally worried about losing his money worried about you know just you know the two years where it's just couldn't do anything hardly and in the middle of that have him just say i got to get away goes up into the mountains and runs into the this woman and then he comes back and what she does is she makes you successful Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of these stories involve hunters who suddenly are really successful at hunting and and such like that. And then what happens is one day they slip up and tell their wives. 
-hmm. and then it's awesome. Uh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a great. That's, and that's it's a great, great archive. Book. I mean, and it goes yes. so far yeah. back into history. And I know exactly yeah. the area in Georgia. It's just dramatic scenery. Uh, these mountain meadows that just like literally are like these, these just incredible things. And uh, yeah. but uh, I was told by some locals who said, "Don't go up to, into the Swanetti area to film this," I, which I I wasn't going to. And I said, "Why?" And they said, "They still believe in her up there." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so it. then uh yeah. but he's back in the city and he starts it's like the autumn and the city is filled with trees most of them have fruit and such and grape mm -hmm. but come october november they're all starting to like the sag and you get these these wonderful streets they're just filled with uh they don't trim trees here like like the French are obsessive about keeping their trees like little nubs in the winter. They don't do that here. They just let them grow. If the tree goes into a house or something, they're like, eh. <laughs> so, uh, but it's it's these marvelous dark, uh, uh, you know, yellow light with uh, the shadows of dark, you know, dying trees over it. And, and you start, and after a while, you start seeing her off in the corner over there, and you start, and he starts getting really worried because, of course, at some point he slips up. I haven't fully finished the idea yet, but but then mm -hmm. I, I figured um, it might end a little bit like uh, in Fantasia, the, uh, the 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 demon on the night of Bald Mountain. He hears the church bells and he goes, <laughs> and and I think it might end with some some scene like that because you often hear will hear uh, Orthodox church bells in certain places, but mm -hmm. I'm still debating that ending. So, uh, yes. but it it's it's either that or it gets killed. So, <laughs> but I think I think it, it it's like somehow he's rescued at the last minute. But I'm I'm thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But no, i I so I've got a, a, one of the principal ballet dancers in town here, who's a, a very one of my closest friends and she I, I she's willing to do the the dolly and i've told her so what i want you to do is come up with a special walk that it, it doesn't look dance like but i want it to be i i want all of that her movements to be choreographed and, and mm -hmm. i want it to be very a very certain kind of a style and then I'm going to uh, work with uh, Georgi, who's uh, both, uh, he's an actor, but he's a theater director. But he's the guy who's going to be the uh, the main actor. And I want you to, uh, I, want, I want to work with him on dialogue. We don't want a lot of dialogue. We want to keep it dialogue light and communicate prim primarily visually. But there will be moments when it was. But the nice thing about keeping it dialogue light is it can therefore translate fairly easily into other countries right. and yeah. there's enough talent here as far as cinematography and everything that i could hire uh, some pretty uh i mean they think they're expensive but by <laughs> you know, the biz standards they're not at all you know because they don't have yeah. these unions and all the rest of it so yeah uh, but yeah but hey that's if you're interested <laughs> let me know uh <laughs> I finally well, you know I, I can get the money for me. And uh well yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh no, I was just gonna say, you know, it, it would be it's interesting because I have actually been meeting a lot of filmmaker or aspiring filmmakers in the little corner of the internet community. Right. And um I almost wonder, man, you know, I wonder if there's been cultural there's been festivals like we went to in germany there's been the the chino conferences the thunder bay conference i wonder if there could eventually be a film festival too you know wouldn't that be cool i mean i i think that there's you know there, there could be multiple films that come out of the of that of this weird collection of internet uh of types um that uh you know, because because I really, really, really enjoy the film festival experience. I I went to Sundance religiously from right. 2004 all the way up until COVID. Right. And there's just something about that, um, that cultural phenomenon right. of people going to a festival to watch the films, to interact with the filmmakers, the actors, you know, and, um, and, and it's, 
it's something that I think it culturally is um, could be lost. You know, mm-hmm. if um, if just in the same way that a lot of the universities are not what they used to be, you know, right. and then you'll find little little kind of enclaves of people recovering um, class what a classic university is like um, Ralston College or something like that, right. you know. And well, so I just wonder. There, if the film there are two film festivals here. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they're fairly well attended and uh, they get international films. They, this is where you'll often get uh, Georgian films as well. And they'll be subtitled in English. And uh-huh. I think that, um, no, it is. See, culturally, it's not like America here. I mean, yeah, you'll see some tattooed people. You'll see uh, some pink hair. You'll see... Uh, you know, people who spent, you know, uh, the electronic music scene was, was, has been happening. Although a good friend of mine who knows something about it says she thinks it's dying now, which is fine with me. <laughs> but, uh, but as far as culturally, we're not where America is at all. And we are, because there's this time lag. I asked a friend of mine yesterday, where do you think we are? And he said, 70s. I don't know if I agree. I think it's more like the 90s. Um, it's like they, uh, when I first got here, almost no one had tattoos. Now they have tattoos. That feels like the 90s to me. And um, um, I think that, that uh, so the thing about the 90s was there was there was still, even though it was a very ironic, but it was also an outrageous time. And I don't think Georgia is doing that. But nevertheless, there was still serious stuff going on, you know, compared mm-hmm. to what was happening in, I don't know, the early uh, the teens or whatever. Uh, you know, they're, they're influenced by the West. But, for instance, I, I've never found a geek here. You know, that is to say, there's no one who lives for anime. There's no one who lives for Star Wars. You know, they'll go to the movie, they'll come out and go like, yeah, I like that. I didn't like that. Uh, much like I did when I first saw Star Wars in 1977. You know, I, I walked out and go, oh, that was interesting. I wasn't as good as George MacDonald novels, but, you know. And, and uh, you know, but at that time in the 70s when Star Wars ca- came out, there wasn't the culture yet of all these people obsessed over, you know, the, the, uh, the world building and everything. So now so, you, it's a war zone, these sorts of things, but there's nothing oh. like that here. And so, for instance, well, so, it's amazing how many people I've met. I would ask a, a, a girl who's like 22 years old, what's your favorite film? She'd go like, uh, Tarkovsky's Stalker. And it's not because they wow. like Russia. Uh-huh. <laughs> Russia attacked them. They don't like Russia. They just like Tarkovsky. I'm going like, mm-hmm. that's it. Yeah, yeah, people here will like some interesting films, you know. Yeah. Well, so there's a sense that maybe you can time travel. Um, you know, you, you, people say, well, you can't time travel, but maybe you can. Maybe you can You can sort of yeah. well, see. Well, I moved from New York City to Alaska. And in New York City, I was like surfing, hanging 10 on the edge in 1996. Mm-hmm. I got to Alaska I don't know if they ever quite caught up to where I was in New York, <laughs> you know, maybe mm-hmm. near the end, the whole, uh, you know, yeah. many of those things were there. But when I arrived, it was like the 1980s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. Um, yeah. I think, I think it's, um, well, I, I had something I was going to, I was going to say, but I forgot what it was. Um yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it's I think it's it's fascinating the idea that you could that. Uh, oh, I, I remember what I was going to say it, when I was in 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 on Corfu on the island of Corfu in Greece. Um, there was a sense of uh, they didn't approach their time the same way that we approach our time in America. You know, uh, it's like we have an agenda. Like mm-hmm. we need to get this done, you know, and I lived on, I don't know if I told you when we were in Germany, but I lived on what they call sticky street. The locals call it sticky street, which is this alley, old alley in uh, old Corfu town. And I said, why do you guys call it sticky street? And they said, well, because you come here and you think you're going to be here for an hour, but you're here for five hours because all of the cafes have little 
um, uh, tables outside and you can just right. kind of go from one to another and all the, mm-hmm. all the restaurant owners are hanging out with you and, you know, whatever it is. And, and um, I don't know, I just think that there's a sense, like we were talking about the, um, the multiverse, right. you know, that's what America is like now. It's like yeah. the multiverse. There's instant amounts of different identities you could step into. There's instant amount of different stories you could be a part of. There's just all kinds of different fragmented experiences constantly going on from your, all these different screens, you know, from your phone to your computer, to the television screen and back. And then, you know, everybody's watching a different show and everyone's halfway through it. And you're, you're, you're living this really, really fragmented life. Right. And what I got in Greece was, one life living Mm -hmm. only one life at a time right you know and that is so profound the idea that you can just live one life (laughs) because we're all living multiple lives over here Mm -hmm. in america it seems like yeah georgia feels quite distinct and itself which uh is one of the reasons i love being here like when I talk to Georgians, mm-hmm. now there there are some Georgians I would consider much more Western leaning, and some that are there are actually a few that are more Russian leaning, but many of them are just Georgian, you know. And uh, I I just it's it's an interesting culture, and I really like the people here. Uh, they they're hospitable, but not necessarily smiley friendly in the American way. So some Americans come here and said, I thought they were hospitable. But, uh, you know, they said, you have to understand what Americans are like to other people. We start off really smiley friendly. And then after a while, we kind of fade. <laughs> <laughs> right. Short attention spans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm really looking yeah. forward to, um, to this uh, gathering in Georgia in October because mm-hmm. that's... Um, It'll be interesting to introduce people who've never been here, here. So I've got, I think about three Americans, but then I've got a Latvian guy. I've got, I think one or two Dutch people. I've got a uh, um, Southern Swiss Italian guy. I've got a, an Israeli and uh, I would like a couple of more, but hey, if it's just seven or eight people, that'll be great too. And I'm sure it'll be yeah. one. But it would be very interesting just to get there because you know especially the americans they they won't have any clue about this culture and it'd be nice to go oh, and sure. surprise yeah well, well there's something that happens i think for americans of getting outside of america and encountering another culture you just you're never the same yeah. afterwards you know, you're you're just going to see everything with with a new set of spectacles and uh yeah, so I think it I think it'll be great. Like I said, you know, in my email, that is exactly right up my alley. If it wasn't yeah. for the fact I'm the sort of person who spontaneously does go off and do right. interesting things because I think things are endlessly fascinating, you know. Um, so so well, yeah, I think I've decided I'm gonna try this again, uh, if not next year, the year after. Uh mm-hmm. and uh or maybe next year, but I'm I'm still thinking about when. It won't be exactly at the same time because I want to give other people a chance to come. So I'll keep you in mind. Uh okay. <laughs> I, I think you would really love it here. I think you'd you'd probably start getting tempted. So <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, so so what do you what do you think you you want to put some of this up or do you want to just well, schedule some of another? Pretty program? good, and uh, I don't yeah. know if all the talk about uh, uh, customs would work, but I'm going to go back and listen to it. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, so I'm going to if if I think there's a, a core here that could work, so I might do that. Yeah. Okay. But and if you want to go back, it and... has no problems. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if, if you want to, you know, schedule another one and we can do the movie talk, yeah, we'll do, you know, and then, we'll, then we'll talk yeah. more. We'll go back to talking more about where we are, but I, you know, I couldn't rehash that. <laughs> no, 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to get, um, once I have some scenes cut from this little documentary, I'd love to get your take on it. You know, if, if you ever have the, 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 the time to look at a scene or two and give me your, yeah, your sure. impression, I'd love your feedback, yeah. you know? And uh, yeah, I've watched my share of documentaries. I have a whole wall of documentaries back in Alaska. Mm-hmm. Just one whole shelving system. It's just nothing but documentary. 
series. So nice. <laughs> and I think I watched over a hundred hours, maybe two hundred hours on World War II. And I did that in mm-hmm. one year. I just said, mm-hmm. okay, let's do it all. I've, I'd watched stuff before, but I said, let, now let's go through it all. And then I did another year later, two years later, I did one like that for World War One and found as much material as I could. Now here I've got a bunch of Vietnam things that I've gone through and uh, I like kind of pulling them together, but I, I, I'm kind of a sucker. I have spoken word records <laughs> and I have over mm-hmm. a thousand, which is right. just like most people are like, what are you talking about? You know, but <laughs> that includes history, actualities and uh, yeah. poetry, the complete works of William Shakespeare, uh, comedy, uh, you know, everything Winston Churchill ever said, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger doing uh, his squats on a record. I, he says, I call these squats. <laughs> you know, it's like all these <laughs> instructional records on how to do exercises. Yeah. A record on how to ski. I love that. Okay. All right. <laughs> a record, <laughs> a vinyl album, how to ski. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. So actually, it would be interesting because what I'm trying to do with this little documentary is I'm trying to disembody the um, the pattern a little bit of what I, the the common pattern that I'm seeing from people, mm-hmm. which is uh, that they go from some sense of the meaning crisis to some sense of not belonging into a quest for meaning or for a spiritual home or something like that. Yeah. And so I've been, I've been gathering what I call confessionals. Uh, you know, I put a little confession booth in the uh, at the Chino conference and let people come in and do their audio. And now I'm having them send right. their audio to me. And I'm not sure. I'm just doing drone, drone footage mm-hmm. and music and then weaving together these um, these little confessions. Right. And so if you'd like to contribute, um, you know, your story of it's basically what the what the little corner of the Internet has done for people in terms of that pattern. Meaning crisis, not belonging and some kind of a quest. Yeah, I'm kind of a little yeah. different yeah. in the sense that, you know, I certainly didn't come alive watching Jordan Peterson. And I discovered mm-hmm. Paul just because I was saying, I wonder if anyone's put together what Peterson is doing with Christianity. And I found Paul. Uh, mm-hmm. And I also around that time discovered Jonathan Peugeot and, and the rest. Uh, but I, I never went through the meaning crisis because... I became a Christian at the age of 15 through the Jesus movement. So I have this like really weird, wild and woolly history. I ended up at Le Brie in Switzerland in 1978, then spent 16 years in New York City and then 22 years in Alaska. But way back, by the time I'd say I got through with Le Brie in Switzerland, I was kind of like, okay, this is what things do have meaning. And, you know, there was no problem. One of the reasons I put a lot of uh, I put annotated lectures by Hans Ruckmacher up on my channel is because uh, his work was very important to my own thinking. So I never came to it, you know, I, I was just like, I saw Paul talking about this stuff. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm glad people are finally getting, uh, starting to think about these things because for a long time I felt relatively alone. But, um, mm-hmm. but yeah. And so if you want something from me, it'll be a different than what other people do. So mm-hmm. no, I I'm I'm right now I'm just interested in in whatever someone yeah. wants to give me in terms of a little bit. Yeah, I got in touch with Paul because someone I I I saw him uh talking about Francis Schaefer one day, and then he said, Does Labrie still exist? So I wrote him going, Yes, it does. I I gave a lecture there last year. <laughs> you know, and uh yeah. and that's how and then we I I did a few rando conversations with him and uh, uh about those kinds of subjects and then we went on from there we discussed quite Do you a think that the that the online conversations from what they're calling this little corner of the internet is reminiscent of the conversations at Labrie or somehow embodying the yeah, same kind of spirit the 70s conversations at Labrie in particular uh when I first went there um and, and I think that that's a, an interesting analogy. Of course, there is one big difference, and the one big difference is it's happening on a screen. And I think yeah. that's 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 always a problem because it has to get off the screen. And I think one of the things I, I picked up on when I was at uh, Landau at the Bridges of Meaning Festival 
was the fact that people were wanting to actually put shoe leather on this and meet in, meet in person. And that was the reason I, I came up with my idea for here. Because uh, I said, okay, yeah, it's going to cost a little bit of money, but I think if you if you're willing to do it, it means you're serious. You know, I cut off all the people who just hang around and just get the really serious people. And so, okay, great. You know, but I think it's uh, for me when I deal with people here. You know, I deal with no one here through the internet. I just wait till I see them again, and that uh, could be a year. You know, it, it could be uh, a month. It could be. You know, but I'll just get in touch. And what I'll just simply say is I'll send a little message, which, yeah, is through the Internet. But we don't do any conversations within town like this. And um, yeah. uh, so I have a friend who's uh, I think he's working on his second or third doctorate right now. He's a philosophy uh, student. And um, he is he comes over about once every couple of weeks and we have a big conversation and. Uh, it's very interesting. I mean, he's very well trained in philosophy. It's interesting when we talk, though, he has, he, he, you know, whatever it is I'm saying, it's just like, it's like coming out of, from Mars or someplace. You know, it just, he's never heard anything like that. <laughs> and and uh, it's interesting here, for instance, you take the most left-leaning person here, and then I start to tell him about the things like the what is a woman debate. And they look at me like, what are you talking about? And then they'll, I'll start to tell them, uh, my friend Lasha, the, the philosophy student, I said, next time you come over, I will show you. I, I got together about an hour's worth of video clips and stuff, and I just showed him. And his jaw was just dropping because he'd never seen anything like this before. You know, drag, drag queen story hour and you know, women who could not define what a woman is and all this other stuff. And uh and and I think and I and I and I've I have another friend, uh, Sandro, I told him, yeah, if you went to America, you think you're left wing here. But if you go there, they'll think you're right wing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so that's the question, you know, are you are they traveling to the future when they come to America? And are we traveling to the past when we come to Georgia? You know, well, that's or a is or is it alternative realities? You know, that mm -hmm. different different journeys that cut off at a certain mm -hmm. point. What's interesting is, for instance, there are people who want more LGBT freedoms here, so they're more Westernizers. And I'll talk to them, but then I'll tell them, well, like you're here on on this side of the hill going up, and you want to get up here where you where you imagine we are. We're not there. We're on the other side of the hill, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 then I start to tell them what's on the other side of the hill that they can't see the the confusion and complications. And they're like, I said, yeah. So the freedom part is great. But what happens is there's a thing that starts to tip into something else where no, you can can no longer express yourself freely anymore because of the freedom that you're afraid of offense. And I said, you'll see this in movies. If, if you've been to any movies, you'll see all sorts of aspects of this, but you probably won't register it the way I would, you know? So they see the things, but it doesn't resonate with them the same way. So one thing that's interesting here is, of course, they ha all have smartphones and you'll see, you know, uh, young girls on smartphones and stuff. But when I look outside my window, I live in this 1956 uh, constructed Soviet building with a big courtyard outside. And in the courtyard, there are trees and there are benches. And I look outside and I always see Georgian, younger Georgian people out there talking to each other, which to me is just yeah. a wonderful thing to see. Yep. Because they're not talking to each other on the phone. I'm sure they send messages. Um uh, Facebook is used very differently here. It's used more for, uh, not so much for uh, any sort of conversation as it is someone will post something. I've posted uh, collections of photographs of some of the dancers here and immediately get a thousand likes from people I've never met. I mean, uh, 500 of them, I'm nowhere near being a friend or anything. But they just pass it all around. 
And, mm -hmm. and you know, in America, we'll say things like, yeah, who uses Facebook anymore? Well, Georgians do. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, um, it's, yeah, it's just very interesting how everything gets translated here into uh, their culture. But like I said, mm -hmm. there's no geek culture here. Part of the reason for that is you have to have money to be a serious geek. If you want to, you know, collect uh, plastic little toys and Funko Pops, if you want to get back issues of comics, if you want to do all the geeky things, uh, you know, you know, join certain uh, websites and all this stuff, it all costs money. And Georgians don't have that kind of money or that kind of time for that sort of thing. Because most Georgians are running behind trying to catch up with their personal expenses. There has been a bit of inflation in the last a couple of years because of uh, the Russian Ukrainian situation. And so the Georgians often have two or three jobs. So they don't have time to be geeks. <laughs> you know, uh, do, you, do you think they're happier than huh? Americans? Do you think yeah. they're happier, even though there's less money yeah. involved? Yeah. I mean, they all also have this image of America, which I, I it's my job to break. And I'll say like, so here's your America. New York City, maybe Washington, D.C., maybe not. Florida, Texas, Southern California, maybe San Francisco. They go, yeah, because now can you name any other places? One girl says, yeah, yeah, I can. I said, where? Ohio. I said, Ohio? <laughs> You realize uh, no American ever wants to go to Ohio. <laughs> I said, where did you hear about Ohio? Somewhere online. But uh, and then I'll tell them I'm from Alaska and they have some vague sense of Alaska. It's just like, oh, really cold. And I go like, yeah, to you, <laughs> you're a Georgian. Zero to you is 32 degrees to me. So zero to me is cold. <laughs> you know, Fahrenheit zero is seriously cold. But zero, you know, when the water freezes, who cares? <laughs> you know, and don't tell me about 38 degrees or 40 degrees. Tell me about 100 degrees for heat. Yeah, I like that. It's it's human. It's like zero, yeah, 100, yeah, and, and such. But no, the Georgians are uh, generally weather wimps on the yeah. cold side. So they're like Southern Californians. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know what I mean? Like, th th there's so much depression here in America now, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, no. so here's like, the moment. Do you find that? So, this was uh, the first year I was here. They have a metro that comes by every five minutes on, on time, totally full of people. I'm waiting for one to come. So, you know, in the metros and subways, there's like this little zone right at the edge of the platform. And there's a line usually. And I was just kind of stepping over it to look to see if the train was coming. And I was coming back. And then I thought to myself, oh, I better watch myself because you know, I used to live in New York. And people get pushed in front of subway cars all the time there. So I, then I looked back at all the people on the platform. And I said, none of these people are going to push me. I could just tell by you know looking at their faces. These are not the faces of crazy kind of people who are going to push you in front of a oncoming subway. And then I started thinking about it. Well, I do see, like, for instance, old women begging on the streets. But they're not homeless. They all have homes. Everybody knows who they are. They just go out for a little extra money. And uh, there's one woman, she just always, I come up, if she sees me, she'll go like, cheeseburgery she wants me to go into wendy's and buy her a cheeseburger you know but they all have homes they're not homeless and, and they, so they're beggars you know um but I, and i thought about i've been here four years i think i've seen you know like in new york city if i walked around the block i'd see a crazy person or two here i've seen three or four in my entire time here I mean, the kind of person walking down the street talking to themselves or who look like, you know, just completely out of it for some reason. And then I started thinking to myself, and, and as I was looking at the people on the subway platform, I said, how come I don't see any crazy people here? There's over a million people. That's plenty for to have crazy people. And then I thought about it and I said, it's because everybody knows where their family is. Hmm. You know, you have relatives here no matter who you are. 
you know, you, you, the way Georgian houses are arranged is somehow wherever you're standing, someone seems to have a window looking at. It. It's really strange. Um, but, but I realized when I moved to uh, New York City, I didn't know anybody there. You know, I did eventually, but they're all people like me. You know, I did know some New Yorkers who had families there, but most of the people I met were from somewhere else. You know, they're in their 20s or 30s or something. I left when I was 41 because it was time to go. Uh, but at a certain point, I could feel myself slipping. It's like it didn't take me, but it was close. You could just feel this the isolation of n nobody knowing who you are, the anonymity, the uh, you know running into problems with. What do you do when you run into problems with relationships, and then there's nobody around who's really deeply connected to you, like in a family. And I think that's the problem in America is that from an early age we're told to be ourselves, to be unique. Follow the dream. Do what you have to do. Don't let anyone tell you. Don't let anyone get in the way of your dreams. So you're always told to be an individual. Um, and the truth is you need other people. And you need that family. And you need, I mean, here it's not just the, it, it, you know, uh, for instance, if a girl gives birth to uh, a child while she's still, say, a high school student, Nobody here talks about the epidemic of teen pregnancies. You just hand her over to her mother, and then the child, go she goes on with her life, and eventually she takes it back over. Because you have entire family networks, clan networks. And even though Tbilisi has more people from other parts of Georgia, they still all kind of know where their people are. Not only that, they know which village they came from. Their, that their family, more of these kind of people, came from. So hmm. I I think that is the difference. And when I talk to Georgians about that, and I try to explain to them the level, say, what's happening on the streets of San Francisco or something, you know, they just don't understand it at all. They just, it doesn't make any sense to them. You know, because it's, it, they can't imagine that environment. You know, where there were these people be living on the street, shitting on the street, taking drugs on the street, having sex on the street, you know, living in tents, plastic blue tents and such, tarps. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's something about globalization and the money that globalization brings, like the mobility. And there's a sense of when we get what we want, because of all that wealth, there's side effects or something, you yeah. know, because maybe we, maybe I would be annoyed to have that many close relations or something. Cause I'm an American, I'm an independent, you know, right. um, but you have to take the consequences of that. Maybe, which is this, which is the isolation, you know, and uh, maybe that's what a lot of people are trying to figure out right now in America is uh, you know, how do you belong somewhere? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in a way, you could look at it as, I don't think it's a case of traditional versus the new people, because I think even the traditional people in America are very non-traditional in many ways. You know, they, uh, but I think that there is a sense, see, I think on both sides of the political divide, there are people who want something to help get around the alienation. You know, the problem is it's easier said than done. Simply wishing, you know, if we could just take care of everyone. Yeah, if you could just take care of everyone, you'd be like Canada and be a lot more assisted suicides because you're taking care of everyone. You know, it's it's um, it's a devil's bargain. I The one thing I do take hope in is that in America, and not just America, is that because of the extremities on the left and to a lesser degree on the right, they're down there, but they don't really have that much airtime. But in the middle, we'll say between somewhere between right and old left, center right, center left, uh, Christians, some atheists, but I've, you know, there, there are LG and B people. There are all sorts of people. 
people who in the 1990s were at each other's throats have been brought together to have the kinds of conversations they probably should have had in the 90s. Hmm. And I think that's what uh, our corner of the internet is a part of. It's happening on a broader scale, but I think that's part of we're connected with that. Wow. Yeah, that's true. It's true. Yeah. So that that is good news, you know, because (laughs) uh, now the problem is, will these extreme people who are forcing everyone into the center uh, go away? Uh, no, they won't. Uh, they're going to turn into more something like transhumanists of some sort of species later. But I think right now, uh, the the problem is they they are creating a lot of laws and they're creating a lot of pressure in school. They're, they've been trying to take over the messaging system in Hollywood and, and the media. But I think we're starting to see a pushback, again, by a broader coalition of people. But we again, it was like when we were talking uh, in the the uh, the lost tape, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the the one that that didn't go through. The uh, the we don't know where we're going yet. One thing I find really fascinating about this period is it's all fluid. We don't know. You, no one can predict what five years will be like at all. I mean, there are people out there saying the conspiracy is moving us this way or that way. No, we don't know at all. A lot depends on Mr. Putin. A lot depends on China. A lot depends on Europe. A lot depends on America. And if America fragments too much, the rest of the world is affected by that. And I think people have an idea that that's true. So, uh, but we don't know. You can't predict doom and gloom. You can't predict anything, which to me is great because that means there are all sorts of open possibilities which is one of the reasons I live here now. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, all of the young people are down on the bench having conversations that yeah. are probably very, uh, yeah. well, very the healthy, healthy, normal <laughs> teenagers. I remember when I was young, you know, for some reason we found it really fascinating to spend hours and hours and hours just sitting around talking. You know, I don't think we were saying anything deep most of the time, but, but that is healthy. That's normal uh, teenage life you're just figuring out i can talk i have emotions i can say something you know where oh that's what it was like in greece yeah yeah five hours of you know what are you guys doing today oh we're just gonna go over to so-and-so's house how are you gonna be there oh we're gonna be there for like five hours what are you gonna do just talk yeah yeah uh it's interesting that both of those both uh georgia and greece are orthodox societies Mm, and i think there is something to that um, the Orthodox have somehow managed to sequester religion away from temporal things, uh, in the sense that they've they've just kept it forever the same, and they don't really get a lot worried about trying to you know uh, square the circle, <laughs> you know, try to make it all fit together. You know, they just go like, yes, you know. And I meet people here. It's just like sometimes it's like. Are you medieval? And I'm not talking about like some person out in the, in the small village in the country. I'm talking about friends who work at, uh, you know, who are art history majors who work at museums and such. It's just like, and I'll start getting their their perception on on faith and religion and stuff. I go like, really? Are you medieval? Because <laughs> it's like their whole perspective is different and the church here operates so completely differently from even the catholic church or certainly all the protestant churches in the sense that you don't feel so much like you're you go to church as much as even if you're not a christian you're kind of in the church Hmm. because it's more surrounding which gives you that weird medieval Kind of. Oh yeah, like the, the the festivals that they would go to. There's a there's a big party, like seems like every other week for some saint. Right. That's a patron saint of some area, and and I'm always like, are you religious? And they, well, not really, but the, it's basically a town holiday, and right. they all have this big feast, and they have this big party, and they have all these traditional dances. And I was like, wow, yeah, they, you you're a part of it. If you live in that town, you're a part of it. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. 
And and here, the way the churches work is you just walk in at any time. You go there on a Thursday afternoon and someone's getting their baby christened. You know, uh, it's it's not like you wait for a certain moment. And, and even when I first went to an Orthodox church, I couldn't even find which is the right time to go because it wasn't something that they felt like sharing because everyone knew, you know, <laughs> and and you didn't have to arrive on time. You know, there wasn't, you know, mm-hmm. we're waiting for you to come at 10 o'clock. You know, there was nothing like that. So you could come at 1030, or if, say nine o'clock, you, you could come at 930 and leave at 12, or you could come at nine, 10 o'clock and leave at 11, or you could come at nine o'clock and stay until two. Hmm. And nobody's going to think anything of you because it's, it's open. It's just simply you come, you spend time, you know, sometimes you sit through the whole thing, which is long. Other times you're just there and, and you're in a prayerful mode and then you go, but it's just very different from what I'm used to in Protestant churches is like, it starts at 10 or it starts at 11, it starts at whenever it starts, you know, mm-hmm. and then it ends very promptly at 10 30, 11 30 or whatever. Hmm. Yeah. It's almost like a, a, a point in space, uh, 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 like an axis mundi, like a, like a, a point around which the community kind of like orients itself. Yeah. And it's not, it's not a time, maybe it's not so much a time thing as a, it's a point, it's an actual spot in the middle of the town right. or something like that. And one of the things you see here is everywhere, there's little, they look like mailboxes, but they're locked with a little slot on top. And that's for people just to donate, <laughs> which is, I mean, you, you'll be in the middle of nowhere and you'll see one of these, which I think is just fascinating. I need to do a video of huh. this. Because it's it's just fascinating. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah. And and I didn't notice any big offerings. I mean, maybe it's because I didn't stick around for the whole service. But I've never noticed uh, that kind of thing. Part of the problem here is, you know, I can get into the attitude, but Georgian is kind of a ferociously bizarre language. So, but Georgians are pretty cool people. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I need well, to get going here. Yeah, and, uh, hopefully that was good for you. Yeah, hopefully so. we got something after the after the lost tapes. <laughs> it's it's been enjoyable talking to you. It was nice meeting you originally in Landau, uh, but we didn't mm-hmm. have a chance to talk too much. But uh, yeah. we will we will, as the Georgians say, throw a beat, which means temporarily we'll be just gone from each other a little while, but we will meet again. So okay. take care. Throw a beat. Coming. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Bern. Okay, hopefully I get the uh, thing. So, a good conversation was had with Justin Wells. Uh, It was nice to talk to him. I actually talked to him a bit more now than I did when I met him in person. And at that point, uh, we were just talking a little bit about, well, what's your... uh, which, what, what are you thinking about as far as the documentary goes and such? And, and for him, it was just the nugget of an idea at that time. And I think he's getting closer to uh, figuring out how to do it. So that would be very interesting. And we will talk with him again about the shape of where in the world movies are these days. And uh, we, started, we did start talking about, I was comparing it to uh, the turn from the 1920s to the 1930s when the, the talking pictures were coming in, sound pictures were coming in, silence were going, but it was also the Great Depression. And the next big moment, there are, there have been other moments in between, but the next really big one was at the end of the 1960s where the studio system, is, as it was known through most of the early, mid-20th century, uh, was essentially dying and how a new type of studio system would be born in the 1970s. So, you know, the late 60s, early 70s period. And out of that would eventually come the blockbuster system, which we are living in now. Okay, but we might talk about that again sometime. Well, we will meet again. Throw a beat. Thanks for spending some time here. A people without without history is not not redeemed redeemed from time. time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments. moments.